Linda di Chamonix was composed by Gaetano, Gaetano Donizetti and is based off a libretto by Gaetano Rossi. Donizetti began to compose the music in December of the year 1841. He had been working earlier with Bartolomo Morelli, who had been his librettist. Morelli would be the manager of a big opera company in Vienna at the time, and asked Donizetti if he would be the artistic director of the opera house's Italian season. He also asked him if he could write a new opera specifically to be showcased at said opera house. With such a promise of success and a change to e chance to exercise his musical skills, how could Donizetti turn away the offer? So he began working on Linda as his debut work at this opera house. An interesting fact is that while Donizetti was, op was working on this opera, he used the same room, bed, ink, bottle, and table that Bellini had used when he was writing La Sonnambula. After Donizetti was finished, his work couldn't be performed because the storyline was deemed a little too scandalous for the time period. In the opera, the main couple are lovers, and that was not acceptable at this time. Also, the librettist had made the villain of the opera an aristocrat. That was unacceptable because they didn't want to offend anyone who was an aristocrat or noble and could potentially fund their operas. Therefore, the opera went through a, sense, a series of censorships to determine what was politically appropriate and to make sure nothing was too scandalous. After all the appropriate changes had been made, Donizetti was finally able to have his piece performed in 1842 in Vienna. The pinnacle piece of his opera was the song that we are about to analyze, O Luce di Quest'anima. It is sung by the character Linda as she arrives at her secret meeting spot, only to discover that she is late and miss the chance to spend time with her secret boyfriend Carlo. This song is very showy and dramatic and requires a lot of practice and discipline to perform. It is said that Donizetti wrote this specific recitative and aria for Fanny Tacinardi. Fanny was a greatly renowned coloratura soprano of her time and was held in great esteem by Donizetti. Fanny performed the role of Linda in Paris. This was the first performance that occurred outside of Vienna. The opera turned out to have huge success, with O Luce di Quest'anima as the main showcase piece. In fact, it is said to have been Donizetti's most successful work, and the opera was then performed regularly for the next 40 years. It fell into neglect for a while after 1887, but has since been brought back to be performed numerous times. Analyzing the song that gave Lindad's popularity during this time is very enlightening. There are many styles of the Romantic period evident therein, not only in style, but it is also structurally sound for this time period and follows the normal opera style of recitative and aria. First we'll analyze the recitative. The recitative is comprised of measures 1 to 39. Measures 1 to 2 modulate through many different keys as they are accompanied by a basso continuum. The following chart graphs these modulations. As measure 15 is reached, the accompaniment begins to be prominent and a meter and key, which is A minor, begins to be established. Here is an example of the establishment of the key that happens prior to measure 15, found in measures 13 to 15. The established key of E minor continues until measure 21, where it is established in the key of C major. Here is the transition in measures 19 to 21. This change is fitting when the text is taken into account. For measures 15 to 20, where it is minor, Linda is saddened because she has missed the opportunity to spend time with her secret boyfriend, Carlo. It changes in measure 21 because she begins to imagine the hopeful future that she believes they are going to have together. Therefore, we can see that the recitative is clearly painted by the text, as, it, as is very common with recitatives from the Romantic period. While text painting is evident in the recit, the aria is composed to show off the ability of the singer. The aria is set out in the following format. You can see that sections A and C prime are all in C major. 
and sections B are all modulatory. Um, section C is excluded from this pattern due to any lack of theme or phrasing. In each section, the chords alternate between variations of a major 1, minor 2, major 5, major, major 4, and minor 6 chords. The following chart shows the chord progression of sections A and A prime. While the chord progression follows no specific guideline, this aria follows a very standard pattern as far as the sections are concerned. Both stanzas are identical in key and in notes, but one difference is that the soloists normally embellish and add ornamentation upon the repetition of ABA. It can begin to seem mundane after hearing the same section repeated multiple times as is here. The modulatory B sections offer some variation, but is it required something more to keep the middle class audience at which this opera was aimed entertained and interested. During this time period, many new styles and ideas came forth and were common among the composers to try and maintain a new flair to the very similar sections in a song. Examples of such things are the bel canto style, Rossini crescendo, and the idea that the orchestration supports and doesn't compete with the vocalist. I will describe and demonstrate these concepts in this piece and the slides to follow. The first is bel canto. This style of singing called for an elegant style of singing characterized by a seemingly effortless technique, an equally beautiful tone throughout a singer's entire range, agility, flexibility, and control of every type of melody from long lyrical lines through florid embellishment, much of it improvised. Many factors play into this style, all of which are evident in Oluce di Costanima. A clear example of how it moves through the singer's range can be found in these measures 97 to 98. Notice how the singer is expected to sing a D-flat 4 and only one measure later leap up to a B-flat above high C. Bel canto style also requires insane vocal agility, flexibility, and control. This is especially evident in measures 108 to 112. The singer must be able to scale runs of 16th notes repeatedly with hardly any time to breathe and having to make it all seem effortless and natural. The aspect of bel canto style that makes this piece all the more interesting is the ornamentation. Not only was the singer expected to ornament, but was given the privilege of adding it wherever they may choose. The more ornamentation, the more variation. Therefore, for it was all the more entertaining for the audience. Um, there are multiple examples of this in this piece, but the best are found in measure 72 to 73 and measure 99. Notice how the ornamentation notes are smaller than the regular notation. Also how the accompaniment is silent. This allows the singer as much time as she desires to perform the ornamentation. The smaller notes simply imply that the singer needs to or add ornamentation here, but that the printed notes are only suggestions. Many performers take these ideas and add whatever combination of scales and leaps that they can imagine. The Rossini Crescendo Rossini was also an important composer at the time of Donizetti. One idea that he introduced and Donizetti implemented in this piece is known as, known as the Rossini Crescendo. It is where a phrase is repeated each time louder than the previous and usually at a higher pitch. Notice how it is slightly rising higher and higher each time in measures 109 to 111. This gives the effect of growing anticipation since it changes only by a few half steps each time louder than the time before. It is especially appropriate when the word being sung, which is vieni, and which is translated to mean haste, since Linda is beckoning for her lover to come to meet her once more. Both text and melody beckon to the listener more intently each time. Orchestral support. The last thing that the composers of the Romantic period did to help the audience stay engaged was the way that the orchestra supported the singer. Beforehand in history, the orchestra would ha also have intricate parts. This caused it to be difficult for the listener to know which to focus on, the singer or the instrumentalist. The orchestrational parts in this piece are not very intricate, but support and compel the vocalist lines forward. This can be seen in measures 40 to 41. Notice how the accompaniment is playing in a boomchuck fashion. 
this allows it to be a harmonic foundation for the vocalist however the instrumentalist didn't have to sit there and boringly support the singer the whole time there are moments when they are were allowed to shine as well these moments are found in the parts where the vocalist drops out or sings far less intricately this is where the accompaniment takes the stage and captures the audience's attention for a brief moments, as seen in measure 66 to 72. This brief analysis of Oluche di Costanima shows many things. It demonstrates how this piece has a very structured form, since the sections are very similar. It also shows typical Romantic period influences, such as bel canto style, the Rossini crescendo, and the support of the accompaniment. All of these things prove why this song became a memorable part of the opera and a beautiful challenge for all those performers who take it upon themselves to learn it. I didn't want to stop you, but that...